Hello and welcome back to another video with it's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be learning how to calculate formal charge. So what is formal charge or what is it used for? This is a way for us to be able to validate our Lewis structures and to make sure that we are creating what is considered the lowest energy structure, meaning what is considered to be the most correct structure. Now, when we use the word charge, this is a little bit of a misnomer, meaning that it's a little misleading. Leading. These are generally what we consider fake charges. They allow us to just be able to figure out what is the low, what is the most likely structure. So it's another tip, another way to be able to have another tool in your little chemist toolbox for how to figure out all these little missing pieces. So formal charge, what it uses is a very simple formula when it's all based on what our valence electrons are and our Lewis structure that we are drawing. So its formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons minus the number of lone pair electrons that you have drawn around an atom. So for example, if I were to draw, uh, let's say, um, let's say hydrogen, for example, and I have just one little dot here. Well, the way that that would work is, well, we have one valence electron, we have one lone pair electron, and it's making no bonds at the moment. So this would be a formal charge of zero. So the last little part is valence electrons minus lone pairs. And then that's going to be minus the number of bonds around the atom. So it's kind of taking into consideration all these little parts here. So we're just counting what we have. And the goal here is when we're looking at these, just to remember is that these are not real charges. This allows us to figure out what the correct Lewis structure is. Because the goal here is to have what I would consider to be the smallest um essentially the smallest possible charge on each of these different atoms, right? If you calculate it and you get a number that's two or three, that's very large. You want to try to have zeros and ones, and that tells you that your structure is correct. It also should match up what your ionic charge is for your entire molecule as well. So it is related to the real charge if you have an ion. So it's just another method. To use. Um, the big thing is, though, too, is this helps give chemists and biologists insight into the chemical reactivity. So if something has a negative or a positive charge, or if it has a lonely electron, this gives us some insight on what is happening in the molecule. And this pairs very well with the, with the uh, with octet rule violations or octet rule exceptions, which is gonna be in a follow-up video to this one, and how exactly they can kind of pair together. So let's take a look at a bunch of different examples here of how we can use this for ourselves. And you can add this as another tool to be able to write Lewis structures. Let's do it. With writing Lewis structures, this is what we're going to be doing. So the first thing is whenever we have a Lewis structure and any of these covalent bonded molecules, Typically, the central atom is always written first when we have a molecular formula. So nitrogen would be the center here. And from knowing our valence electrons, from looking at the periodic table, it has five different valence electrons, whereas hydrogen, right, and we have three of them that are bonding, has one valence electron. Uh, one tip that I always have is to line them up with all the lonely electrons. So we're going to put all these hydrogens in, just like so. Okay, and then we are going to bond them together by connecting them. Okay, so what we have here is ammonia being connected. So that's the name of this molecule. And what we are actually going to do now is calculate what the formal charge is for each element. Now, being that we only have two different types of elements, it's a very quick little calculation for each. So let's start with nitrogen. So the first thing is how many valence electrons did it have? So it started with five valence electrons, right? Nitrogen has five. Now the question is how many lone pair electrons does this have? And you can see here is, okay, we have two lone pair electrons that are near the structure. So what we are going to do is five minus two. Now the next thing is, is we're going to subtract the number of bonds we have. So it's lone pair electrons minus bonds. So we have five minus two minus three. And you can quickly do this math in your head, which is the best part. You don't need to calculate it. So 5 minus 2 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. 
So what does that tell you about this molecule? Well, it tells you that its formal charge is zero. So what we could do is just write a little zero next to our nitrogen, which is good. You want to have something that's as close to zero as possible. Zero is perfect. That's letting you know, all right, we got what we want. Um, now, that doesn't always mean that you have the final structure. You got to check everything. But the goal is to have as low of numbers on everything as possible. Ideally, you want zeros, one, plus ones, and so if we do hydrogen, which is the same thing on all of these, we're going to do the exact same thing. So we have one valence electron. We have zero lone pairs on hydrogen. And then we have one bond that's being formed. So once again, you can do one minus one, and you see a charge of zero. So what that's telling you is all of the hydrogens have a zero formal charge. So this is your correct Lewis structure. It's a way to check your work. So let's go on to another example. We have four valence electrons around carbon. So we're going to write four dots. Now we're going to connect all the pieces. So one thing is being that carbon has a tendency to make four bonds. You can notice that you have four different element or four atoms that are here. So we're going to be connecting all of them. So let's use a different color here for hydrogen. We'll do purple for hydrogen. We'll line them up with the sides. And it doesn't matter which side you choose. So if you choose, like, on, let's say you wanted to put one on the right, that's fine. As long as you kind of put them all, as long as you have the right number of them. So now we have our fluorine. This has seven valence electrons. We're going to put seven dots around it. And now what we're going to do is connect all of our bonds. So we have one, two, three, four. Carbon has a tendency to make four bonds. Hydrogen has a tendency to make one. Fluorine also has a tendency to make one. All those are happy. Now, do you always have to check your, your formal charge? You don't always, but it's something that gives you kind of like a second check. So what we'll do is for all of them, let's do them individually. So we have carbon is the first one. There's four valence electrons, zero lone pairs, and then four bonds. So we have four minus four is zero. Now for hydrogen, it's going to be the same idea, right? So all the hydrogens that are here, we have one valence electron that started with. It has zero lone pairs, and it's making one bond. So it's also zero. And then if we check for fluorine, well, it's going to be the kind of same idea. We had seven valence electrons we started with. We have, we have essentially have six lone pair electrons and one bond that is here. So we have also zero. So when you're wondering where the heck did I get six from? Well, being there's one, two, three, four, five, six dots around fluorine. Okay. So it's checking our work. And you notice that they're all zeros. So it's telling you, okay, what you drew is correct. A way to check your work. Let's go on to another. Okay. So sometimes with these structures, they can be a little bit more tricky in trying to figure out how they are bonded. So we have HONO, which is for this one, a lot of molecules are written how they are bonded, meaning kind of like how they're bonded in order. So we're going to do the same kind of idea. And going off our bond trends, we can kind of plug in our pieces. So I've been I kind of mentioned that before. And if you've seen my previous videos, and you kind of might already know, is that there are bond trends. So hydrogen always makes one bond. Uh, nitrogen always makes three bonds. Oxygen always makes two bonds. Then and earlier we saw, okay, carbon made four, and the halogens have all been making, uh, been making uh, one bond. So we have trends that we can follow here. So what we're going to do is we're going to be making uh, this bonded in order. So we're going to start with hydrogen on the far side. We're going to put the one dot. We're then going to put in oxygen next. So we got oxygen, and that has six dots around it, so just like so. Then we're going to put in nitrogen, which has five dots all around it. And then we have oxygen, which also has six dots around it. Okay, so everything's lined up just like the way we want it. Now, what we're now going to do is connect all of our pieces, and then we'll verify it using formal charge. So we'll connect hydrogen and oxygen. That one's easy, being that hydrogen always makes one bond. 
So now oxygen needs to make one more bond to make itself happy. So why don't we make it with the nitrogen next door? All right, so this now has eight valence electrons around oxygen. And we can even try to see like, okay, when we do formal charge, we'll see, does that make sense uh, for when we are doing it? Now for oxygen, as I said, this has a tendency to make two bonds. Nitrogen has a tendency to make three. So what we can quickly do for ourselves is rearrange this and make a, tri or a double bond between nitrogen and oxygen and connect them all. Now, is this right? This is where formal charge can help us. Is this, does the structure make sense? So hydrogen, we're gonna do the same math, right? It started with one valence electron. It has no lone pairs. It's making one bond. So that means it has a number of zero. So, so far, that looks good. Now we're gonna switch to oxygen. So the oxygen on the left, so we'll put a little L next to it to say the left one. It has six valence electrons. It has four lone pairs. And on top of that, we are making two bonds. So we have a six minus six, which is equal to zero. Okay, so put a little zero over top. The nitrogen had five valence electrons, has two lone pairs, and it's currently making three bonds. So we have another zero. So, so far, so good. Everything has zeros. Now for the right oxygen, so I'll put OR just to denote, hey, we're doing the right one. Uh, and this one's going to be the same idea. So we have six minus four minus two. And once again, that is equal to zero. So the four lone, four lone pair electrons, two bonds around it. So everything is happy. They all have zero across the board. That's the goal. It's on you. Hey, you have the correct structure. Let's go on to another example. Okay, so for this question, draw the Lewis structure for the sulfate ion. Now, this is one of the places where the formal charges are gonna help you realize what the ionic charge is. So here, sulfate has an ionic charge of two minus, it is not the same thing as formal charge, but it allows you to be able to see how are the charges really distributed. Now, the big thing about these is the, char the real charge favors electronegative elements, meaning things that are up and to the right of the periodic table, so close to fluorine. Now, with this one, the thing about it, sulfur is an octet rule violator, meaning it likes to expand what, it's avail what is available to it. So being that sulfur has six valence electrons, it can utilize the vacant d orbital to allow for more things to bond to it. So what do us all that mean? What we're going to do is we're going to place our six electrons around it. So we got one, two, three, four, five, and six, just like so. And we are going to put our oxygens around on all sides. So we're gonna have oxygen on the left, right, top, middle, and bottom, just like so. Now the thing is, how do we know how many bonds we're gonna have? How does this work? So this is where our trick that I learned that really helps me remember these. And it has to do with understanding how double bonds and single bonds work with formal charge for oxygen. So for oxygen, if I have oxygen that's a double bond, so let's say if I put in a double bond around uh, one of these, different atoms here, so we're gonna connect this. How does that work when it comes to formal charge? Well, oxygen has six valence electrons. Right now it has four lone pairs, so I'm gonna put those in white so we can see them. And then we have two bonds that are being formed. So it's six minus four is equal to zero. So it has a formal charge of zero which is great. That's what, one of the things that we want here. We want a formal charge of zero. Now, what about O as a single bond? So let's do O single. So meaning, let's say if I were to put in my dots for this oxygen over here, and I'm just going to put one dot on the side. How does this one work? Well, O as single has essentially six minus six lone pairs that I put in here, I added an extra one, minus 
one bond that's here. So this is a negative one formal charge. So what this tells you is that the structure is going to have two single bonds, two double bonds, because we need to make a overall charge of negative two on the structure. So it's something that helps you predict what you are going to have when you are to draw these. Now, do you always, will you always remember those trends? Potentially, no. So one of the things for when we are trying to write these, right, is so starting over with ourselves. So keep that in mind that we're going to prove that we have this double single bonds that we have on the side. So it all comes down to being able to first for sulfur is know how many valence electrons you have. You have six valence electrons. For oxygen, we have six valence electrons. We have a total of four atoms. And then we have two extra electrons that we need to, to keep in mind. So how many total do we have? Well, we are going to have a total of 32 electrons that need to be distributed in this structure. So when we are going to show this, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write down our sulfur, which has our six electrons all around it. Now we're going to put in our oxygens. So we put in one, two, three, put in our six electrons on all sides. Just like so. Now, really the thing is that we're supposed to do first is separate our, or essentially just connect everything as if it was just making one single bond first. So we're going to connect the oxygen, the sulfur, the oxygen, the sulfur, just like this with single bonds. And now the issue with this is that we see that we have extra electrons that exist within our molecule. So we have all of our single bonds, and then we have two electrons that aren't doing anything on the middle of sulfur. You also have multiple electrons that aren't doing anything with the other structures as well. So this is where we're going to be making some double bonds. So let's make our double bonds with two of the oxygens, in that that's all that sulfur is capable of doing. So we'll make one on the left, one on the right, just like so. Of reorganize this a little bit just to make it look a little nicer. Okay, so we have our structure just like so. And what we are going to now do is, being that we have two extra electrons, you first want to add them to the external atoms first. So, what we are going to do is, and that's to complete any octets where they are needed. So, we can see that. Two of the oxygens don't have a complete octet. So this is really the general idea for trying to show this ionic species having a two minus charge overall. But is it correct? Well, if you remember from earlier, we proved to ourselves what double singles have. So if you notice, we have two double bonds. So we have one on the right-hand side, one on the left. And then we have two single bonds, one on the lower portion, one on one on the top. So this is showing you, hey, your formal charge is currently being obeyed. What about sulfur? Is sulfur happy the way it is? Well, it has six valence electrons, and it's currently making, it has zero lone pairs and six bonds, so it has a zero. So what we can see is, okay, for each of the single bonds, we have negative one, and we have zero on all the structures are all the elements in the middle. So it's a happy structure. Now, is this the only way to draw it? And one thing that you might see peeking on the bottom is this is where something known as a resonance structure can peek its head up, meaning that the doubles and single bonds, they can change positions and lead to potentially different structures that are possible. Meaning that, let's say if I were to draw my molecule of sulfate. Why did I pick the double bonds on the sides like the way that I showed it before? Could I have drawn them where they were on, let's say, the left and the right? Um, or sorry, on the top and the bottom. Why did I choose that? So resonance is all about where double bonds could potentially switch positions 
just like the one that I have down here on the bottom, where there's multiple different places where you can place double bonds. Um, maybe if I wanted to potentially place them where I had sulfur, had a double bond on top, a double bond on the side, single bond, and a single bond on the other part, you have different options available for resonance. And that's sometimes that can happen. And the whole idea is because every atom is unique, they can switch to different locations. So when you have these alternating double and single bonds, something known as resonance structures are possible. Okay. But it's still all based on your formal charges. Okay, our last question. Which resonance structure is the most common for the cyanate ion? So here I have the cyanate ion, and we're going to look at this concept of resonance. So below, I have three different resonance structures that are drawn. I have the first one, second one, and the third one. And each one of these, as you can see, is, looks a little bit different. Different number of double bonds, different number of triple bonds. And what we're going to do is using formal charge is determine which one would be the, the most likely one that you're going to see. The thing with resonance is they're all possible, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be, there might be a preference for one versus another. So, and this is something that gives you an idea about chemical reactivity. So something with a negative charge and that has many resonance structures, usually you see it in a lot of different reactions. Or maybe it could be something that's very stable and used for all kinds of pharmaceutical reasons to help stabilize maybe a drug or something as well. So before, right, when we were doing all these, right, the how we calculated charges was we did the valence electrons. So if we do oxygen, we have six. And then we have right now on this first structure, we have uh, four lone pairs that are all around it. So it'd be six minus four. And then it's making two bonds. So we have six minus four minus two. So this is equal to zero. Okay, great. Now we'll do the same thing with carbon in the middle. So carbon is has four valence electrons as zero lone pairs on it. And it's making four bonds. So this is also zero. Fantastic. Just like we want. Now if we look at nitrogen on the far right hand side, it has five valence electrons. It has four lone pair electrons and two bonds that are currently being formed. So how, how much is that? Well, this has a negative one charge to it. So we'll have a negative here. Okay, great. So we have zero, zero, negative. Looks fantastic. Let's look at the next one. So with this structure, we have oxygen again. So oxygen's making a triple bond in this one. So let's check our math. So it'd be O. We have six minus two lone pairs. And then it's making three bonds on it. Three. So this is going to be a positive one charge. So six minus five, positive one. Now with carbon in the middle, right, it's going to be the same idea as what we had before. We have four valence electrons minus zero lone pairs, and then four bonds. So this is going to have a zero charge. Then for nitrogen, we got six valence electrons, six lone pair electrons, and then one bond. So this is going to be a um, negative one, or sorry, I did the math a little bit correct here. We have five valence electrons, minus six, minus one. So this is going to be a negative two overall formal charge. Now, is that okay? Well, it is a resonance structure. It is possible. But if you remember from the beginning of the video, the goal was to have the lowest number possible. Two is actually considered very high. You want zeros and ones. So most likely, this will probably be the least common structure out of all of them. Okay, It's possible, but it's going to be very unfavorable. Okay, last one. Let's do the last O. So O, we have six minus six valence electrons, or sorry, lone pairs, minus one bond. So we have negative one, so a negative one here. And then for carbon, we have four minus zero minus four. So that's going to be over zero. And then for nitrogen, we have five valence electrons, two lone pairs, three bonds, so zero. So we have zero, zero, negative one. So what are we going to compare? We're going to be comparing essentially the first structure 
and the third structure. So let's kind of rearrange some things here. Let's kind of rearrange it. And what we're going to be looking at here is between one and three. So what's which one would be the more favorable out of the two? Well, they both have a negative one charge. One of them is on nitrogen. The other one is on oxygen. So which one is more likely? Well, this is where we're going to be learning about something known as electronegativity. So in my other videos, we're going to have learn about electronegativity. And what that's all about is a periodic trend. Essentially, if we have a periodic table, the more you go up and to the right of the periodic table, the more negative those elements tend to be when they are bonding, meaning they are a little bit greedier when they want to take in their electrons. So oxygen is a little bit more up and right than nitrogen. So the most likely structure is going to be number three. Okay, so this would be the most common. Number one would be the second most common. Number two would be the least common. So resonance say all exist. That's just which one is the most likely. And you can also think too, you can see your bonding trends, right? Nitrogen three bonds, has the three bonds here, carbon wants to make four. But oxygen usually wants to make three. So it's all about which one correct all of them. Okay. So this has been formal charge. I know it was a little bit of practice within a little bit longer, but it goes through all different types of examples of how to show that. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this video helped a little bit.